trying to silence liberty. That's how libertarians are describing big tech's crackdown on so-called hate speech that Twitter, because of that, they say they've suspended several libertarian accounts, including Ron Paul, Institute Director Daniel McAdams. So is this a deliberate effort to silence them? Here now is Dr. Ron Paul, former Texas congressman and host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Dr. Paul, uh, good to have you here. We have heard Thank that you. Mr. McAdams' Twitter account is back on. Now, we have tried to contact Twitter. They have not returned our calls. Have, have they made any attempt to either apologize or explain their actions to you or Mr. McAdams? Not to me, but I think uh, when he was put back on there was some type of a, an apology about it, but I don't remember the wording. But it was uh, associated with a, a form of an apology and that they put him back on. Well, do you think it you was know, a mistake or do you think it was a deliberate effort to silence you guys? I think um, probably both. They're deliberately attacking many libertarian conservative constitutionalists, and that is common practice. But then, then again, I think they do make mistakes. They overshoot because uh, Daniel McAdams hadn't even tweeted anything. He promoted something. Somebody else said something, and all he did was retweet it. And uh, so I guess his guilt level was lower, and they decided, and it might be that maybe public pressure still helps because we did get some attention on the websites and people like you and others talk about, you know, could they be targeting right. constitutionalists and libertarians? And I do think that helps. I think it was uh, maybe helpful for uh, maybe uh, Facebook reassessing uh, their their tools and, and their techniques on how to pick and choose who gets to be uh, well, promoted you, on their websites. You know, there are all these algorithms, you know this very well, that, that kind of alert organizations like Twitter or Facebook or whatever to, to what they call hate speech. But I can't think of anything in the libertarian jargon that would do that. Can you? No, a matter of fact, it, it, and I know you understand the message because it's built on, on nonviolence, non-aggression, right. and and many time many times we we cite Martin Luther King because he he was a peaceful person that uh, defended his position. But well, and he did for not those for those who don't violence. know, for those who aren't familiar with it, conservatives very often chide you libertarians as being too soft on things like defense. So, if anything, as you say, it would be more peaceful message than most conservative websites. But it does lead one to, to, to question whether an entire generation that is now dependent on social media is being kind of led by the nose by editorialists at Twitter or at Facebook uh, who don't believe in, in what you espouse. That is a strong support of the free market and a condemnation of socialism. Yeah, and, and what you're talking about is a real challenge to us, and I've talked about it on my program, is first off, uh, do they have a right to do this? And we would argue they're private. They do have a right, right. and they monitor. And my web page, I can keep people off if they're being ugly and nasty and all these kind of things. But the question is, are they getting any support from the government? And that is where I come down on the side that, yes, they do. They accommodate the government. They provide information to the government. Mm. They, get, they get money in directly when it was developed. Uh, they get advertisement from the government. Now, Facebook has just decided that they use Atlantic Council people to help them sort this out and find out uh, uh, who should be censored and who should be not. Look into Atlantic Council. It's a big government organization. And guess who donates a lot of money to? It's Facebook. So that's a facade. They're, they're not really, you know, that's what they're doing is hiding. Facebook said, you know, uh, if, if, some, if somebody disagrees, we'll just send them to the, to the inspectors that we're hiring to sort this out the for. The censors. No, and some isn't. people call them inspectors. Yeah. Uh, you and I would call them censors. I, I, I'm short on time, but i got to ask, do you think the rise of, of people like Ocasio-Cortez and, and other socialists within, within the Democratic Party, particularly their appeal to millennials, are because of the fact that you have these, these editors or, or censors, if you will, working for social media sites? I, I think uh, partially is the case, but I'm not going to give uh, the socialists uh, too much credibility. Yeah, yeah, there was an election won, but, uh, you know, when we do some talking to young people, I find out that a lot of people don't buy into that. Yeah. So sometimes the polling, when you really get to the young people, you know, they sort of like this idea of peace and prosperity. Right. We advertise <laughs> that for. That ain't bad, yeah. <laughs> you, know, people, you know, what I always say is young people at the age of 18 don't all of a sudden get up and, and, and want 
want big government, more taxes, of po right. poverty, and we need another war. That yeah. young people don't volunteer and march forward. So I think the appeal, ideas have consequences. They're very, very powerful. They, it is said that they can't be stopped by yes. armies. So I still go by no matter how powerful the media and the social okay. networks are. If you have a good idea and it's right, I believe we can win I the fight. Love your optimistic attitude. Dr. Paul, always a pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it.